Hi everyone, it's Ms. Carrie, and today we are going to look at Module 8, the late 1940s to the late 1950s, and this is Part 1 of 2. Change is inevitable in music, and jazz is no exception. Only a few years after bebop arrived on the American musical scene, it began to fragment into several sub-genres. The influence of Bird was widely felt in the jazz community, as the young saxophonist had ignited a spark of musical freedom. The possibilities were now endless, and jazz would begin to move in multiple directions by the end of the 1940s. This liberated aesthetic was adopted with the greatest fervor by pianist and composer Lenny Tristano. This brilliant and forward-thinking musician would exert tremendous influence over generations of jazz musicians. At first glance, Tristano does not appear to be a candidate for a major influence of jazz. The largely reclusive musician gave very few public performances, especially towards the end of his life, and put out a very scant body of recorded work. In spite of these withdrawn tendencies, Tristano was a musical visionary whose innovative approaches still sound years ahead of his time to this day. Tristano was always a brilliant pariah. The young Tristano also received classical piano training, though he later regretted receiving this instruction, lamenting how these lessons were diametrically opposed to everything I was trying to do, which was improvise. This is somewhat ironic, considering how Tristano's early exposure to classical music would play a major influence in his unique approach to jazz. Musical achievements aside, Tristano developed his introspective personality largely as a result of his blindness. Born with poor vision as a result of the 1919 flu epidemic, Tristano would go completely blind by the age of 10. When Tristano began making a name for himself in the Chicago jazz community in the mid-1940s, he had already established himself as a visionary musician. His unconventional personal and musical development contributed to some of the most innovative jazz recordings in music history. One of the first examples is a 1946 recording of the standard, I Can't Get Started. One only has to compare the version by Bunny Berrigan from 1937 to Tristana's forward thinking realization to understand why Tristana was admired by some and misunderstood by many. Instead of merely playing the role of accompanist to Bauer, the guitar player, Tristano adds richly dense chords underneath the guitarist's statement of the melody. 35 seconds in, when the second statement of the melody begins, Bauer takes a back seat to Tristano, playing a counter melody while Tristano reharmonizes the melody, superimposing new key centers as he emphasizes the altered extensions of the song's underlying harmony. The rhythmic, harmonic, and melodic interplay between Tristano and Bauer increases until the end of the recording, and right when it sounds as if both performers will resolve, Tristano modulates to a new key briefly before ending on an expansive and beautiful yet unresolved extended chord. This process of dissecting the original song in order to explore new musical possibilities is the epitome of jazz improvisation in its highest form. Listen 
to I can't get started and compare it to the Bunny Berrigan version. The links are in your textbook or you can look it up online. Lenny Tristano, I can't get started. In module one, we discuss the role of harmony in music. As jazz evolved, jazz musicians, particularly pianists, began to develop more sophisticated harmonies to support melodic ideas by soloists. The simple three to four note chords of earlier jazz were now replaced by more complex, denser chords. In module four, we discussed how extensions or notes stacked on to a basic chord to provide greater variety and nuance were significant in the evolution of jazz harmony. By the 1940s, pianists, notably Tristano, began to experiment with the concept of taking the stacked notes alone to create brand new harmonies, which led to the popular practice of reharmonizing or adding new chords to a melody. There's a video in the textbook that demonstrates keeping the melody the same while changing the underlying chords. This graphic shows adding chords, adding notes on to the basic chord. So a basic chord is one, three, five, and then they added the seven one, three, five, seven. And with these new extensions, they added the nine and the eleven and thirteen. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. And they would break these up or play them all at the same time. And that is the new expanded harmonies you hear during this period. Several of Tristano's pupils would go on to become collaborators with him, a practice which is still common in jazz today. Alto saxophonist Lee Kernitz adopted many of Tristano's principles while also emulating Charlie Parker. The result was a juxtaposition of intense melodies taken at breakneck speed with a relaxed and refined sound. This new cool music required an improviser of the highest intellectual caliber and technical facility. The genius behind Lee Kernitz's playing is that he was able to play some of the most complicated melodic lines ever crafted in jazz yet make it sound completely effortless. There's a selection in your textbook entitled Subconscious Lee that rapidly presses forward at a brisk tempo, yet Kernix, Tristano, and Bauer seem to be casually gliding along, their improvised melodies possessing a calm, logical, and at times nonchalant aesthetic. Perhaps most impressive is just after the two minute mark when all three musicians trade eights once through the entire form of the song. So to trade eights is a term used in jazz when each musician improvises for eight bars before passing their solo off to another performer. A bar is four beats long, so it'd be one, two, three, four, two, two, three, three, two, all the way up to eight, and then you pass it to the next person and they have that long to solo. This interplay is a musical conversation where each player often reacts to what the previous soloist has stated, creating an interpersonal musical dialogue. Kernitz, Tristano, and Bauer's command of the bebop language and polished technical facility on their respective instruments creates the effect of a seamless stream of consciousness 
where all three performers are fluidly continuing the same larger idea in their improvised chat. Be sure to listen to Subconscious Lee, Lee Kernitz with Lenny Tristano and Billy Bauer. Tristano's development of a new jazz sound and aesthetic is only one of his many contributions to the medium. Tristano was the first jazz musician to record a genre known as free jazz, a subgenre of jazz where the musicians are not tied to the underlying harmonic structure of a song. This liberation from having to follow the chord changes is first seen in Tristano's aptly titled Intuition where the pianist and his musical comrades, including tenor saxophonist Warren Marsh, use their highly accomplished ears and knowledge of harmonic and melodic construction to improvise new ideas, free of any predetermined or notated musical score. In the hands of an untrained group of musicians, this aesthetic of listening and reacting without any previously dictated musical direction could easily lead to musical chaos. But the sextet on this groundbreaking recording are always listening to one another, cognizant of what they are collectively hearing on a melodic, harmonic, and rhythmic level, reacting with logical and at times highly cerebral musical gestures in real time. Be sure to listen to Intuition by Lenny Tristano and his sextet. Tristano also stands out as an innovator in his concept of sound and the different ways sound can be manipulated in the jazz performance to create a different effect for the listener. This is especially true in the 1955 recording, Line Up, where the pianist employs the technological capabilities of the recording studio to alter the original performance. On this recording, Tristano uses overdubbing, a process used in the recording studio where one track is laid down in the studio and then one or more additional tracks are recorded on top of the original track. In this recording, Tristano had the rhythm section lay down the first track, then he superimposed his own piano playing on top of the recording. So listen to Line Up by Lenny Tristano, and the link is listed in your textbook. At the time of this recording, Tristano was criticized for his manipulation of the live performance. However, overdubbing has since become a standard practice in most recorded modern music. Just about any song you listen to on the radio makes use of this innovative procedure. While Tristano was not the only first person to utilize overdubbing in the studio, his application of it in jazz, a medium known for the spontaneity and interaction of live performers, is indicative of this brilliant and pioneering artist's overarching musical concept. Here we see Tristano's guitarist, Billy Bauer. At the same time, Tristano was developing his own new cool sound. Another New York musician would forge a similar yet distinct sound as well. Miles Davis, arguably the most significant musician in the history of jazz, would begin his long and prolific recording career with a seminal album in the jazz pantheon, Birth of the Cool. At the start of his musical career, Miles Davis dropped out of the prestigious Juilliard School of Music in 1945, abandoning his classical trumpet studies to become a disciple of Charlie Parker. Miles' decision to enter the unknown and explore new musical territory would not only inform the remainder of his musical career, but also begin what would become 
an almost half century musical journey that made a major impact on all music, not just jazz. Playing with Charlie Parker, Miles received a crash course in the bebop language. His education in this idiom would greatly influence his playing. Yet Miles, like Tristano, possessed his own unique voice. The consummate jazz artist, he would spend his career appropriating the sounds of the musicians whom he listened to and played alongside to forge his own distinct voice. In 1948, Davis graduated from the bebop school, figuratively, leaving Charlie Parker's band to focus on a new project. Birth of the Cool was the result of Miles' desire to create something new. And, while attributed largely to Davis, is actually the result of several musicians collaborating, notably producer and arranger Gil Evans, and baritone saxophonist and composer Jerry Mulligan. It is important to recognize, however, that Davis's leadership skills in bringing these musicians together was the catalyst for one of the most significant albums in jazz history. Davis drew his inspiration for Birth of the Cool from two disparate influences. On the one hand, the album drew heavily from the melodic language of bebop music. By contrast, Miles also drew his artistic concept from the sounds of a swing era ensemble, the big band of pianist, arranger, and composer Claude Thornhill. The flowing impressionistic sound of this ensemble's signature hit, Snowfall, would provide a template for the ethereal and at times dreamy soundscape Miles was aiming for with Birth of the Cool. So listen to Snowfall by the Claude Thornhill Band to get an idea of what Miles's influences were. The combination of unresolved mysterious harmonies with unique instrumentation inspired Miles and former Thornhill arranger Gil Evans to begin working out of Evans's basement apartment on 55th Street in Manhattan in 1948. Davis formed a diverse and talented band of musicians, including Lee Kernitz, pianist John Lewis, who would later become the musical director of the Modern Jazz Quartet, which is coming up in the next module, and drummer Max Roach. The latter individual was especially significant in his approach to jazz drumming, carrying on the Kansas City tradition of pulsing with the ride cymbal and hi-hat, but elevating the drummer's role from simply keeping time to a musical equal with the other members of the ensemble. Roach's masterful use of syncopated rhythms with his bass drum and snare drum while he kept time on his cymbals provided a new polyrhythmic texture which has since become the standard for modern jazz drumming. But the playful and interactive nature of the drums was only one part of this new sound. Birth of the Cool employed some unusual instrument combinations, including the infrequently utilized French horn and tuba, a juxtaposition of high and low brass instruments. This approach to instrument pairing was replicated in other groupings within the Nanette, a nine-piece group, which is the group that's on the album. The low-high configuration of trumpet and trombone, as well as alto saxophone and baritone saxophone, provided the album with its distinctive sound. In the opening track, Move, we hear all the aforementioned elements 
coalescing into a multifaceted sound, where each instrument can be distinctively heard within the overall combined texture. The individuality of the instrument sounds is echoed in the unique approaches of each improviser. One only has to compare Kernitz's rapid-fire linear approach with Miles Davis's use of silence to hear how the same arrangement can be divergently interpreted. Indeed, Miles was a master of using space to create memorable solos. Improvised ideas possessing brilliance in their simplicity. Davis stands out as one of the master improvisers in jazz history for a very different reason than Charlie Parker, Lenny Tristano, or Lee Kernitz. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Miles sought to create memorable melodies crafted after the original song. Indeed, Davis is one of the few improvisers whose solos are often more notable than the tune on which they are based. Miles's famous statement was, when you play a note, it should mean something. Listen to Move, featuring solos by Miles Davis, Lee Kernitz, and Max Roach. The listening link is in your textbook, or you can find it on Birth of the Cool. The up-tempo escapades of Kernitz and Roach on the opening track aside, most of the album comes across as a sort of chamber recital, a concert of music that fuses the beauty of classical music with the hip mannerisms of bebop. In fact, Winthrop Sargent of The New Yorker suggested that the album is not really jazz. While this is certainly a stretch, there are moments in Birth of the Cool where the lines between both genres are blurred. On Boplicity, the unconventional voice leading, which is movement from one note to another note for each particular instrument in the ensemble, creates a mysterious, intense mood against the strolling tempo of the track. The glue holding the listener's attention is the sometimes disjunct yet instantly recognizable melody. Jerry Mulligan's languid solo over Lewis's sparse piano comping and Davis's brief but catchy solo both capture the refined mood of this music. So be sure to listen to Boplicity from Birth of the Cool listed in your textbook that features solos by Jerry Mulligan, Miles Davis, and John Lewis. Unlike Tristano, Miles had succeeded in something very difficult, creating a work of art that was both intensely cerebral while being accessible to a wider audience. It is interesting to note that Capitol Records did not release the album in its entirety until 1954. Ultimately, a compilation of recordings made by the Nanette between 1949 and 1950. By the close of the 1950s, however, this album had become a favorite among jazz audiences, firmly establishing itself as a classic part of the jazz canon. Miles Davis, however, was not someone who was content to rest on his laurels. By 1954, his musical direction had changed. With Birth of the Cool, a thing of the past in Miles's mind. He was now forming one of the greatest jazz combos in jazz history, which has since been referred to as the first quintet. The huge success of Miles Davis's first quintet did not happen overnight. The widely acclaimed ensemble was only formed after a very difficult transitional period in Miles's career. 
Shortly following the birth of the Cool Recordings, Davis made a career move which had proven beneficial for many of his contemporaries. The trumpeter moved to Paris. For Miles, there were two very simple reasons for this departure from the States. First, there was more work available in France, especially in Paris, where the sounds of modern jazz were increasingly gaining popularity. And secondly, the French were more tolerant of African Americans, a stark contrast to the prejudice attitudes of a racially divided and in the southern United States, segregated America. In spite of his success across the pond, Miles ultimately felt the pull of New York City and returned to New York in the summer of 1949. Upon returning to the Big Apple, Miles had trouble finding work and, like his idol Charlie Parker, soon became addicted to heroin. As his addiction gained a stronghold, Miles's playing deteriorated, and he began to resort to working as a pimp. The once innovative jazz artist had truly hit rock bottom. It seemed as if Davis's career had officially ended. But Miles's love of jazz proved a powerful catalyst in ending his drug addiction. Miles returned home to his wealthy family's farm, getting much needed support from his father, a dentist, and breaking his addiction by locking himself in a room for an entire week. Davis was now poised to take the jazz world by storm once more, and the trumpeter began to form a band that would meet his new creative vision. The ensemble featured a roster of lesser known musicians who were largely unknown, even in the jazz community. But Miles recognized these four individuals' potential to forge a new sound. Pianist Red Garland impressed Miles with his blues-tinged style fused with a light and crisp attack on the keys. Garland had an almost playful, nonchalant approach, a refined style that simmered down the pianist's Texas blues roots into a cool sound that complemented Miles' more subtle approach to bebop. On the first quintet's classic recording of I Could Write a Book, it is immediately clear from Garland's concise and tasteful introduction that the pianist was a perfect fit for Miles' often minimalist aesthetic. Be sure to listen to I Could Write a Book. The listening link is listed in your textbook. The rhythm section also consisted of two largely unknown musicians. Drummer Philly Joe Jones was one of the most versatile percussionists of this era, able to gently coax subtle textures from his cymbals with delicate brush strokes, while also providing exciting rhythmic pops on his snare drum, which never detracted from the music but always added just the right touch. Bassist Paul Chambers may have been the youngest member of the ensemble, almost a decade younger than the other four musicians, but proved to be a precociously talented musician. The foundation of the first quintet, he fulfilled multiple roles as a bassist, knowing when to provide rock solid harmonic and rhythmic support as well as demonstrating an aptitude for melodic phrasing and technical precision in his solos. But what perhaps contributed most to the commercial success of the first quintet was Miles Davis's musical direction. As a band leader and arranger, he had a very clear and unique approach to arrangements of traditional standards and popular songs. 
Miles would often dictate specifically what he wanted each member of the ensemble to do, going so far as to even tell each musician what part to play on their respective instrument. This emphasis on arranging a work prior to performance is common practice in larger ensembles in jazz, notably big bands, but contrasts with the bebop setting where all of the ideas, with the exception of the melody and perhaps a few occasional intros or ending sections, are completely improvised. Davis's preference for tightly arranged versions of traditional standards in the smaller ensemble setting of a jazz combo, however, did not dis detract from the individual creative contributions of each member. While Davis had specific ideas in mind, he also possessed a unique ability to allow just enough freedom for each performer to have their unique voice heard when improvising a solo. There's a recording by the quintet called Dear Old Stockholm that showcases this balance. As you listen, you may notice the tense, syncopated opening chords emphasized with a hypnotic and subtle undercurrent. This somewhat menacing opening in a minor key with Miles's signature trumpet sound utilizing a Harmon mute seen here emphasizes the darker qualities of the music. However, the character soon changes, dramatically blossoming into a joyous fanfare one minute in. The bass solo by Chambers that follows is punctuated by the memorable rhythmic jabs of the song's introduction, providing structural unity for the listener, even during Chambers' improvisational voyage. The changes in mood throughout this song create a wide variety of sonic atmospheres, almost providing a musical narrative where the scenery changes with each section or the introduction of each new soloist. This was no accident, but all part of Davis's genius at being able to balance his specifically arranged ideas with each of the musicians' individual voices as improvisers. Be sure to listen to Dear Old Stockholm that is listed in your textbook. Of all the musicians in the quintet that Miles recruited, one would go on to gain the most prestige and fame in both the jazz community and the larger American musical scene as a respected soloist and improviser. John Coltrane, one of the most significant composers and tenor saxophonists in the history of jazz, was a perfect foil for Miles' understated approach. Coltrane would develop a new approach to playing that would ultimately be referred to as a sheet of sound, where strings of notes coalesce into a larger, continuous sonic stream, creating a powerful and forwarding moving melody. In a later module, we will discuss both the musical concept in greater depth, as well as Coltrane's impact on jazz in the late 50s and 1960s. At this early stage of the saxophonist's career, however, we see a young musician beginning to form his musical concept. One can hear the probing, inquisitive, and cerebral yet intensely visceral and passionate nature of Coltrane's immediately recognizable sound on the first quintet's famous recording of Round Midnight. You may recall this composition from the previous module, Module 7, as one of Thelonious Monk's signature tunes. 
Ironically, Monk did not care for Miles' introspective interpretation of the melody. Yet the version Davis recorded with Coltrane, Garland, Chambers, and Jones is considered by many to be the definitive version of this popular jazz standard. As you listen, notice how Miles' sparse and ethereal rendition of the melody contrasts with Coltrane's longer, sweeping melodic lines. The listening link for Round Midnight can be found in your textbook. Ultimately, the first quintet, though influential, was short-lived, only recording and performing as a stable unit for a two-year period before Coltrane left to begin his own projects. In this short span of time, however, this significant ensemble put out a string of classic albums, including Round About Midnight, Relaxin', Cookin', Workin', and Steamin'. No jazz collection is complete without these major works. In three later modules, we will see how Miles continued to shape the sound of modern jazz. Hard Bop. In 1953, when Miles Davis was kicking his heroin addiction and beginning a new stage of his career, two West Coast musicians formed an ensemble which would set the stage for one of the most widely emulated subgenres of modern jazz Hard Bop. Like Davis, Max Roach and trumpeter Clifford Brown yearned for a new sound concept, one that emphasized tight arrangements, clear and simple communication of musical ideas, and, perhaps most significantly, a return to an emphasis on the blues tradition jazz was deeply rooted in. This is not to say that Charlie Parker had abandoned the blues tradition in his bebop music. In fact, many of the Kansas City saxophonist solos are laced with the elements of the Midwestern blues sound. But many of Parker's disciples had taken jazz farther and farther away from its roots. One needs to only think of Miles Davis's impressionistic tendencies on Birth of the Cool or Lenny Tristano's desire to stretch the harmonic possibilities of the jazz language in his innovative recordings and performances. In the early 1950s, some bebop musicians began to criticize how bebop had musically strayed too far from the traditional black American musical forms found in older styles. While bebop was a black American art form, many of the musicians performing in this genre felt that it did not pay enough homage to more traditional black musical genres like blues, gospel, and spirituals. It was during this same time period that Chicago blues an electric version of the Delta Blues was gaining popularity, and artists like Sister Rosetta Tharp and Little Richard were making the first rock and roll records. Enter the Hard Boppers, a group of musicians that included bebop veterans like Max Roach, as well as younger talents who were all on a mission to reclaim the roots of jazz, emphasizing its African-American roots in the soulful sounds of the blues, spirituals, and gospel music. Many musicians led the way in this new style, which fused elements of bebop with the rich musical heritage of jazz's past. But Roach and Brown especially stood out, initiating the movement with a quintet they co-led under their names 
1953 and 1954. Brown stands out as one of the great improvisers and musical visionaries. The Wilmington, Delaware native contributed some of the most influential recordings to American music over a short period lasting only two years. Between 1954 and 1956, the Clifford Brown Max Roach Quintet showed how bebop, when fused with traditional African American styles, could make a powerful artistic and social statement, while also being accessible to a wider audience. Tragically, Brown died of complications from an automobile accident in Pennsylvania in June of 1956. The young musician, who began studying trumpet at age 12 and a decade later had become one of the leading voices on the instrument, was poised for greatness at the time of his passing, and many jazz historians speculate as to what further musical contributions this precocious talent might have offered. Brown was a master of his instrument, playing with a precise, rich, and resonant tone. Brown's sound possessed an ebullient and rounded sound. Whether he was blowing long, sustained tones or navigating a flurry of ornaments. In the following track listed in your textbook, one can hear Brown's dynamic control and lucid melodic ideas in the composition Jordu by bebop pianist Irving Duke Jordan. The infectiously catchy A section, a meanderingly seductive blues melody over a series of stop time hits, hearkening back to the stop time breaks of the early New Orleans music and blues, is contrasted with a heavily ornamented yet logically descending melodic sequence in the B section. Echoing the New Orleans jazz tradition, Brown's and Roach's solos, though based in the melodic language of bebop, stick close to the thematic material of the composition. Brown's deliberate incorporation of fragments of the notable melody throughout his solo is consistent even when the young trumpeter demonstrates his technical prowess with a carefully controlled flurry of rapid sixteenth notes in the second chorus. Likewise, Roach quotes rhythmic gestures of the composition in his solo while maintaining a steady percolating pulse with his bass drum. In many ways, this still sounds like bebop, but the emphasis on groove, melodic repetition, and a focus on musical clarity and simplicity distinguishes as the new hard bop sound. Be sure to listen to Jordu. The blues and gospel aspects of the hard bop sound are especially prevalent in the recording Sandu. Once more, emphasis on melodic repetition and groove takes precedence with an emphasis on concise solos built around blues tinged riffs. Be sure to listen to Sandu and you can find those links in your textbook. If the Clifford Brown Max Roach Quintet was the first ensemble to record extensively in the new hard bop subgenre, then drummer Art Blakey and his ensemble, the Jazz Messengers, were the first group to epitomize this sound. Formed by Blakey in the 1940s, the group saw a major revival in 1955 when Blakey paired with pianist and composer Horace Silver to emphasize the hard bop concept. 
the most prolific composer of the hard bop musicians, Silver contributed some of the greatest and most recognizable melodies in the jazz canon. Unlike Bird, Tristano, Monk, and many of his peers who favored pushing the boundaries of what was, what was melodically possible, Silver was more interested in writing soulful and direct songs, often simple but powerful musical compositions which immediately resonated with the listener and captured the heart and soul of jazz. The blues and gospel aesthetic of the hard bop movement is perhaps best captured by Silver's aptly titled song, The Preacher. In the recording made with Blakey, they embody a return to African American roots with the rapid linear lines of the soloist replaced with hummable, soulable, soulful melodies. On the tune itself, the insistent walking bass line of swing and bebop is replaced with an older two-step gospel field. It is only on the solos that we hear a return to the modern rhythmic texture, but the soloists here still stick close to the blues, especially silver. The majority of the pianist's second chorus or repetition of the song's form during improvisation is built around the same descending figure, a bluesy piano run, hearkening the sound of a gospel pianist tickling the ivories during a Sunday morning service. If you're listening to The Preacher by the Jazz Messengers, that bluesy piano run happens at two and a half minutes into the song. Silver left the Jazz Messengers a year later, but continued to compose in the hard bop idiom, contributing a variety of classic numbers in a myriad of genres. Whether he was writing a Latin-influenced song, Song for My Father, which actually reminded Silver of songs he had heard his Cape Verdean father play at the piano. A poignant ballad, Peace, or a jazz waltz, Summer in Central Park, Silver always maintained his trademark bluesy sound, firmly establishing him as a major leader in the hard bop music and all of modern jazz. So there are listening links in your textbook for Song of My F Song for My Father, Peace, and Summer in Central Park. Following Silver's departure from the Jazz Messengers, several young musicians and composers kept the hard bop tradition alive. Pianist Bobby Timmons composed Monin which will become an anthem of the hard bop movement, as well as a signature tune for the jazz messengers. Saxophonist Benny Golson's Blues March was another popular staple of the jazz messengers repertoire, and trumpeter Lee Morgan would gain success as a solo artist with his soul jazz recording, Sidewinder, in 1963, which achieved a rare status as a hit on the Billboard Top 40, entering at number 25. So be sure to listen to Monin, Blues March, and Sidewinder by the Jazz Messengers. The hard bop movement has since become a defining sound of this era of jazz history, but this, along with the cool school and Miles Davis's unique approach, form only one part of a multifaceted picture of what jazz was in the late 1940s and 1950s. This transitional period would see a plethora of other genres, as well as individual artists with their own unique vision 
of what jazz was. The pioneering efforts of the musicians we have studied in this module, as well as the ones we will learn about in the next three, would form the foundation for modern jazz. Their influence still strongly felt to this day. Glossary, Birth of the Cool, seminal album of the late 1940s, musically directed by Miles Davis, Gil Evans, and Jerry Mulligan. Comping, when a, rhythmic inst when a rhythm instrument, most commonly piano and guitar, provide accompaniment for the soloist that supports and reacts to the soloist improvisational ideas. Disjunct, when the motion of a melody is characterized by skips and leaps rather than stepwise motion. First Quintet, significant group led by Miles Davis in the mid-1950s, recording a prolific body of work. Free Jazz, a subgenre of jazz where an underlying harmonic structure or form is absent, providing the soloists with more freedom to melodically and rhythmically improvise. Hard bop, subgenre of jazz which developed in the early 1950s and fused bebop with African American roots genres such as blues, spirituals, and gospel. Harmon Mute, a mute or small bulb-like device which is placed into the bell of a trumpet to alter its sound. The air normally traveling through the bell of the trumpet is now only able to escape through a small hole in the center of the mute, giving the trumpet a darker, more hushed quality. Miles Davis's signature sound one which contribute to his title, The Prince of Darkness, is partially a result of this unique device. Hemiola, a rhythmic pattern implying a different meter or time signature within the original time signature. An example in this module is the introduction of Lenny Tristano's recording of I Can't Get Started, where the pianist emphasizes every three beats, even though the song's meter is in 4-4, four, four, where every four beats are emphasized. Nanette, nine-piece ensemble. The ensemble on Birth of the Cool is one such example. Overdubbing, the process of recording separate tracks and then overlaying them. Pedagogue, a teacher. Reharmonize, adding or superimposing new harmonies or chords over the original harmonic progression. Sequence, a musical idea that is repeated but on a different pitch. Trade eights, when two or more musicians exchange musical ideas every eight bars during improvisation. Trading fours is a similar process over the duration of four bars. Significant people. Lenny Tristano, pianist, composer. Lee Kernitz, saxophonist, composer, Billy Bauer, guitarist, Warren Marsh, tenor saxophonist, Miles Davis, band leader, trumpeter, composer, Gil Evans, arranger, composer, Jerry Mulligan, baritone saxophonist, arranger, composer, Max Roach, drummer, band leader, Red Garland, pianist, Philly Joe Jones, drummer, Paul Chambers, bassist, 
John Coltrane, tenor saxophonist, composer. Clifford Brown, trumpeter, composer. Art Blakey, drummer, band leader. Horace Silver, pianist, composer. Bobby Timmons, pianist, composer. Benny Golson, saxophonist, composer. And Lee Morgan, saxophonist, composer. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed learning about the jazz of the late 40s and the 50s.